Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Vulcan Centaur Take 2. On Christmas Eve, at least according to Tori Bruno, Vulcan Centaur will finally launch on its maiden mission carrying the Peregrine Lander all the way to the moon. And now that it doesn't have to deploy Kuiper satellites, it's going to be a less complicated mission and a much greater chance for success. But is that really how it's going to go? Are they going to run into even more problems with this troubled rocket? And meanwhile, on this side of the Atlantic, an extremely exciting development. Unbelievably, the United Kingdom is going to be sending four astronauts into orbit on the same mission, essentially doubling the number of astronauts that they've sent into orbit in the entire history of their space program. How are they going to be able to pull this off? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Been very busy lately. I was at Pulsar Fusion yesterday, looking at all the new developments there. It was kind of amazing to me, actually, everything that they've been able to accomplish in the less than one year's time that's gone by since I was there for a uh, tour on the last occasion. I'll tell you, they're doing a lot of stuff moving towards their long-term objective of testing at Fusion per propulsion in orbit. Can't wait to show you all of that. But in the meantime, some pretty amazing things happening in this country on another front, on the front of human space flight. It's long been thought that going to space as, as a UK citizen, as a young UK kid, really was just something that uh, was not realistic. After all, there are only two astronauts who have been to orbit, uh, UK natives, and one of those went to space with the Russians. That being the case, then, what sort of opportunity? do young British children have if they would like to go to space as astronauts? Well, believe it or not, we have a full crew of four astronauts heading to orbit with the help of Axiom Space and the UK Space Agency. Now, when we talk about UK citizens in space, all of us immediately think about Tim Peake, but he was actually not the first UK citizen to make it into space, but rather it was a woman, Hella Patricia Sharman, back in 1991, before the International Space Station was even being built. She had the opportunity to go as a result of a private space mission in the UK called Project G. Juno. She just responded to a radio advertisement asking for applicants to be the first British space explorer. And she was selected for the mission live on ITV on November 25th, 1989, ahead of nearly 13,000 other applicants. Amazingly enough, not only was Helen the first UK citizen in space, but she was also the first Western European woman who got an opportunity to go to space and with the Soviet Union. Yes, the dissolution of the Soviet Union was underway by 1989, but didn't really conclude until the end of 1991, whereas she visited the Mir space station in May of 1991. It's really amazing that that this mission happened at all. Now, of course, we know about Tim Peake's mission as well, which was an astonishing accomplishment in itself up to the ISS. But aside from these two individuals, unless you're an incredibly wealthy private citizen, you really aren't gonna get an opportunity to go to orbit if you're British. Or is that actually the case? Well, Axiom Space was made a practice of taking astronauts up to the ISS on private scientific missions has now collaborated with the UK Space Agency to send four British astronauts up to orbit. And given the fact that NASA will not permit one of these missions to fly unless they have an experienced astronaut on board, 
Tim Peake will most probably be the mission commander or the mission pilot. George Freeman, Minister of State at the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology, had this to say, quote, The prospect of a historic UK mission with Axiom Space has the potential to inspire a whole new generation to reach for the stars while supporting our efforts to build one of the most innovative and attractive space economies in the world. So I look forward to seeing the next stage of this exploratory work develop. We want to put the UK at the forefront of the global race for commercial space investment, continue to support scientists and engineers to test new technologies, and carry out important research, and ultimately bring the benefits back to people and businesses across the country. Axiom Space CEO Michael Suffredini had the following to say, quote, Axiom Space is looking forward to working with the UK Space Agency on a future human spaceflight mission. With this agreement as the initial foundation, we will build a comprehensive mission plan in support of the UK's national and agency objectives to advance its capabilities in space exploration and discovery. Together, we will look to harness the benefits of microgravity and help push the boundaries of innovation to advance our civilization. And incidentally, this is not something that's only open to wealthy British citizens. The UK Space Agency is calling on UK universities, research institutions, and industry to share their ideas for experiments and technology demonstrators which would be conducted by the crew on orbit over a two-week period. Dr. Paul Bate, chief executive of the UK Space Agency, had this to say, quote, This agreement paves the way for UK astronauts to conduct scientific research in orbit and to inspire millions of us here on Earth. It takes thousands of people to complete a crewed space mission and return the astronauts safely home, highlighting the huge variety of careers available in the UK space sector right now. There is much to do, and this agreement is the springboard for the UK Space Agency, Axiom Space, and the mission sponsors to assess how we best push forward the frontiers of knowledge and innovation and showcase the power of space to improve lives on Earth. The UK Space Agency is working with Axiom Space, by the way, on plans for this mission with the full support of the European Space Agency. Daniel Neuenschwander, I think I pronounced that right, Director of Human and Robotic Exploration at ESA, said, ESA is working on Europe's preparation of the post-ISS era and the development of a sustainable commercial space economy in low Earth orbit. This unique flight will allow ESA to enhance its actions with new partnership schemes and implement together with the United Kingdom a series of research experiments which will further deepen the knowledge on exploration in and for Europe. Let me tell you something. This is a big, big development as far as I'm concerned. It's demonstrating that not only Britain, but Europe in general is interested in moving forward with human space missions, even though they don't have the capability of launching these astronauts into orbit yet themselves. That being the case, though, Axiom Space and SpaceX and Crew Dragon makes all of this possible. UK Space President Dr. Alice Bunn had this to say, quote, Since the first astronauts landed on the moon over 50 years ago, human spaceflight has captured the imagination of billions of people. But space is no longer for the privileged few. We have witnessed incredible growth in the application of space technology and data to everyday lives, and we recognize the immense and specific value of humans being able to push the boundaries of science and technology operations within the unique conditions of space. For this reason, the agreement between the UK Space Agency and Axiom Space is an incredibly exciting one, providing the potential to extend the already significant innovation that our UK space sector is spearheading. And by the way, I have reached out to the UK Space Agency, and it looks like I might be able to secure an interview with them about this mission very soon. Please stay tuned and let's move on to the next topic.
Oh yeah, but real quick, before I forget, I would like to thank the 21 new Patreon members who have signed on this month. Ever since I asked folks to start signing on to Patreon to get us up to 1% of our subscribers supporting this channel, well, you guys have responded in a big way. If you'd be interested in joining these 21 people, along with all of our other Patreon supporters, as well as our Discord community, well, that's all in the description. Okay, so what's going on with Vulcan Centaur? Well, hopefully, it's going to be a Merry Christmas for ULA and for Astrobotic Peregrine as well. We've been waiting so long for Vulcan to finally take flight, and there have been so many complications up to this point. All of us know about the challenges that the BE-4 has experienced. Well, I'd like to say frustrations rather than challenges. BE-4 was supposed to be ready in 2019 and is only just now entered service and not in huge numbers either. I can't overstate the importance of this mission. The Peregrine Peregrine Lander is a lunar taxi of sorts, and it has many scientific payloads on board, most of which are from NASA that have directly to do with the success of the Artemis mission. This is a preliminary robotic mission done in advance of humans setting down on the lunar surface, and it can't happen without Vulcan. Now, according to Tori Bruno, they're going to be launching on Christmas Eve, or at least that's one of the possible dates. The other two are the 25th and the 26th, and they're not doing this just so that they can celebrate Christmas Eve at Cocoa Beach. They're doing it because there's only a few days of availability of clear communications with the deep space network, ideal lighting conditions on the lunar site where they intend to set down. All of these things have to happen at a very specific time every 28 days, and apparently the 24th, 25th, and 20th 26th are the ideal times to try to get Peregrine to the moon. Now, assuming this mission is completed successfully, the next milestone for ULA will be to launch the Dream Chaser. And once this is done, they're going to be looking at several more launches of Vulcan Centaur in 2024. However, the long-term objective, starting in the middle of the year, is crazy fast launch cadence. That's something that SpaceX does without even thinking about it anymore, but ULA has never been able to accomplish the kind of launch cadence that they're looking at. That is to say about 25 or 26 rockets a year, a rocket every two weeks. And obviously ULA has come nowhere close to accomplishing something like this in the past, but their mass production capability is is ramping up in a huge way, and they have, at least according to Tori Bruno, an entire fleet of Centaur 5s, piles and piles of solid rocket boosters, all in anticipation of an unbelievable 38 Project Kuiper launches on Vulcan Centaur. It's very difficult to believe that ULA is going to be able to ramp up to this kind of capability, but at the same time, if SpaceX can do it, and do it a lot more than that, actually, I have a great deal of confidence that Tori Bruno's operation is going to be able to pull this off. So what is it, once again, that makes Vulcan Centaur so special? I mean, if you got reusable rockets like Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, why the hell do you need a rocket like this? Well, one big reason fairing size. Falcon Heavy has an incredible lift capability when it comes to payload mass, but when it comes to fairing size, it just doesn't quite stack up to what either Atlas V or Vulcan Centaur is capable of. If you have a big payload, and big in terms of size instead of mass, Vulcan Centaur can handle the job a lot better than either Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, which is going to be very advantageous advantageous for certain types of customers. In addition to that, if we're talking about price points, delivering a heavy payload out to geosynchronous orbit is not really much less expensive with SpaceX than it is with ULA. As a matter of fact, 
it may be no less expensive. The reason for that is, in order to reuse their boosters, SpaceX has to keep fuel in reserve in all three of the boosters if we're talking about Falcon Heavy, which is the only rocket capable of delivering substantial payloads out to geosynchronous orbit. If you are keeping that fuel in reserve, it means you can't deliver as much payload out to orbit, whereas Vulcan Centaur, of course, is burning up all of its fuel and therefore is going to be able to deliver a larger mass out to orbit than Falcon Heavy even can do if it's reusing all of its boosters. This is one of the reasons why Falcon Heavy has to expend the core booster most of the time and sometimes all three boosters in order to deliver the payload out to geosynchronous orbit. This is where ULA has a key advantage over SpaceX. Instead of reusing the booster, ULA intends to reuse just the BE-4 engines, protecting them on re-entry with a lofted inflatable heat shield. If they can reuse just the engines, that means that they don't have to keep propellant in reserve in the booster in order to land it. Instead, they can return the engines, burning all of the propellant in the booster, therefore achieving the maximum amount of payload to geosynchronous orbit and saving the most expensive parts of the rocket. At least that's the theory. Once again, talk is cheap and we're only going to see ULA realize these theoretical advantages once they actually get this rocket off the ground on Christmas Eve. Of course, if it doesn't go right, then we're going to have to wait until mid to late January before another launch window opens up for Peregrine. And that would be a very grim development indeed for ULA. They've fallen significantly behind SpaceX already. SpaceX, for all practical purposes, has a near monopoly on spaceflight, at least if we're talking about substantial payloads with NASA or with the U.S. military. Vulcan can break that monopoly, assuming that the rocket flies and assuming that it performs to the same degree of efficiency and the same degree of reliability as Atlas V has for all of these years. We'll see what happens and we'll be keeping our fingers crossed. And of course, for those of you who are familiar with my 100K challenge, if Starship can manage to carry out a successful orbital mission before Vulcan can do all of these things, I will tattoo SpaceX fanboy on my butt. So I have a lot personally at stake here on top of everything else. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's so important to my channel. Please check the description for various ways to support this content. And as always, stay angry about space.